Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is August 8, year 2021, 11.45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I wanted to share with you today an important essay, short though it is, with the great director, Stanley Kubrick. The essay is part of a Norton Critical Edition dedicated to A Clockwork Orange, the brilliant dystopian novel by Anthony Burgess. Many, if not most of you, are familiar with either the film or the novel, perhaps both. Both the film and the novel raise many questions that remain unanswered. I suggest here that the title of the novel and the film, A Clockwork Orange, derives from Anthony Burgess's connection to British intelligence, its main function being devoted to the maintenance and expansion of the British Empire, and by extension, the New World Order. There remains an important bloodline connection between the British throne and the House of Orange Nassau. I contend that the title, A Clockwork Orange, is a veiled reference to the House of Orange Nassau. The House of Orange Nassau is famed for two primary technologies. One is lenses, optics, optics that go into telescopes and microscopes. So in a sense, the House of Orange Nassau was one of the sponsors of the revolution in the sciences. The other technology would be that of clocks or clockworks. It was through the precious commodity of clockworks that allowed the Dutch traders access into the heavily protected domains of Japan. The initial impulse was to establish trade with that country, but the long-term goal was to bring Japan under Dutch colonial rule. A colonial system such as this requires the manufacture of a certain type of personality to go along with specialized technologies of control. This is what I believe that Anthony Burgess was trying to dramatize in his novel. Let us now examine, in his own words, the motivations, the concepts, the ideas that drove Stanley Kubrick into making one of the most prescient films in all of cinema history. Thank you for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. Interview with Stanley Kubrick by Philip Strick and Penelope Houston. We met Kubrick last November at his home near Boramwood, a casual labyrinth of studios, offices, and seemingly dual-purpose rooms in which family life and filmmaking overlap, as though the one were unthinkable without the other. Despite his reputed aversion to the ordeals of interrogation, Kubrick proved an immensely articulate conversationalist, willing to talk out in detail any aspect technical or theoretical, of his devotion to the cinema. When we came to transcribe our tapes, what indeed emerged was perhaps rather more of a conversation covering a lot of ground than a formal interview. When A Clockwork Orange opened in London a few weeks later, Kubrick found himself in the front line of somebody else's war. The critics were up in arms about straw dogs in particular, and a clockwork orange became caught in the crossfire, especially after the Home Secretary's much-publicized visit to the film. It was an extraordinary fuss. The novel was, after all, published ten years ago. The more so for seeming to be about a clockwork orange that sounded nothing much to do with the film Kubrick made. But it also meant that some of his replies to our original questions would have to be revised to make due allowance for the arguments the film had caused. So what follows is to some extent a Kubrick rewrite of a Kubrick interview in the interests, as always with Kubrick, of precision. How closely did you work with Anthony Burgess in adapting A Clockwork Orange for the screen? Stanley Kubrick I had virtually no opportunity of discussing the novel with Anthony Burgess. He phoned me one evening when he was passing through London, and we had a brief conversation on the telephone. It was mostly an exchange of pleasantries. 
On the other hand, I wasn't particularly concerned about this because in a book as brilliantly written as A Clockwork Orange, one would have to be lazy not to be able to find the answers to any questions which might arise within the text of the novel itself. I think it is reasonable to say that whatever Burgess had to say about the story was said in the book. How about your own contributions to the story? You seem to have preserved the style and structure of the original far more closely than with most of your previous films, and the dialogues are often exactly the same as in the novel. Kubrick my contribution to the story consisted of writing the screenplay. This was principally a matter of selection and editing, though I did invent a few useful narrative ideas and reshape some of the scenes. However, in general, these contributions merely clarified what was already in the novel such as the cat lady telephoning the police, which explains why the police appear at the end of that scene. In the novel, it occurs to Alex that she may have called them, but this is the sort of thing that you can do in a novel and not in the screenplay. I was also rather pleased with the idea of singing in the rain as a means of Alexander identifying Alex again towards the end of the film. How did you come to use singing in the rain in the first place? Kubrick. This is one of the more important ideas which arose during rehearsal. This scene, in fact, was rehearsed longer than any other scene in the film and appeared to be going nowhere. We spent three days trying to work out just what was going to happen, and somehow it all seemed a bit inadequate. Then suddenly the idea popped into my head. I don't know where it came from or what triggered it off. The main addition you seem to have made to the original story is the scene of Alex's introduction to the prison. Why did you feel this was important? Kubrick It may be the longest scene, but I would not think it is the most important. It was a necessary addition because the prison sequence is compressed in comparison with the novel, and one had to have something in it which gave sufficient weight to the idea that Alex was actually imprisoned. The routine of checking into prison, which, in fact, is quite accurately presented in the film, seemed to provide this necessary weight. In the book, there is another killing by Alex while he is in prison. By omitting this, don't you run the risk of seeming to share Alex's own opinion of himself as a high-spirited innocent? Kubrick I shouldn't think so, and Alex doesn't see himself as a high-spirited innocent. He is totally aware of his own evil and accepts it with complete openness. Alex seems a far pleasanter person in the film than in the book. Kubrick Alex makes no attempt to deceive himself or the audience as to his total corruption and wickedness. He is the very personification of evil. On the other hand, he has winning qualities, his total candor, his wit, his intelligence, and his energy. These are attractive qualities in ones, I might add, which he shares with Richard III. The violence done to Alex in the brainwashing sequence is in fact more horrifying than anything he does to himself. Kubrick It was absolutely necessary to give weight to Alex's brutality. Otherwise, I think there would be moral confusion with respect to what the government does to him. If he were a lesser villain, then one could say, Oh yes, of course, he should not be given this psychological conditioning. It's all too horrible, and he really wasn't that bad after all. On the other hand, when you have shown him committing such atrocious acts, and you still realize the immense evil on the part of the government in turning him into something less than human in order to make him good, then I think the essential moral idea of the book is clear. It is necessary for man to have choice to be good or evil, even if he chooses evil. To deprive him of this choice is to make him something less than human. A clockwork orange. But aren't you inviting a sort of identification with Alex? Kubrick. I think, in addition to the personal qualities I mentioned, 
There is the basic psychological unconscious identification with Alex. If you look at the story not on the social and moral level, but on the psychological dream content level, you can regard Alex as a creature of the id. He is within all of us. In most cases, this recognition seems to bring a kind of empathy from the audience, but it makes some people very angry and uncomfortable. They are unable to accept this view of themselves, and therefore, they become angry at the film. It's a bit like the king who kills the messenger who brings him bad news and rewards the one who brings him good news. The comparison with Richard III makes a striking defense against accusation that the film encourages violence, delinquency, and so on. But as Richard is a safely distant historical figure, does it meet them completely? Kubrick There is no positive evidence that violence in films or television causes social violence. To focus one's interest on this aspect of violence is to ignore the principal causes, which I would list as 1. Original sin, the religious view. 2. Unjust economic exploitation, the Marxist view. 3. Emotional and psychological frustration, the psychological view. 4. Genetic factors based on the Y chromosome theory, the biological view. 5. Man, the killer ape, the evolutionary view. To try to fasten any responsibility on art as the cause of life seems to me to have the case put the wrong way around. Art consists of reshaping life, but it does not create life or cause life. Furthermore, to attribute powerful suggestive qualities to film is at odds with the scientifically accepted view that, even after deep hypnosis, in a post-hypnotic state, people cannot be made to do things which are at odds with their natures. Is there any kind of violence in films which you might regard as socially dangerous? Kubrick well, I don't accept that there is a connection, but let us hypothetically say that there might be one. If there were one, I would say that the kind of violence that might cause some impulse to emulate it is the fun kind of violence, the kind of violence we see in the Bond films or the Tom and Jerry cartoons, unrealistic violence, sanitized violence, violence presented as a joke. This is the only kind of violence that could conceivably cause anyone to wish to copy it, but I am quite convinced that not even this has any effect. There may even be an argument in support of saying that any kind of violence in films, in fact, serves a useful social purpose by allowing people a means of vicariously freeing themselves from the pent-up, aggressive emotions which are better expressed in dreams or in the dreamlike state of watching a film than in any form of reality or sublimation. Isn't the assumption of your audience, in the case of Clockwork Orange, likely to be that you support Alex's point of view and in some way assume responsibility for it? Kubrick, I don't think that any work of art has a responsibility to be anything but a work of art. There obviously is a considerable controversy, just as there always has been, about what is a work of art. And I should be the last to try to define that. I was amused by Cocteau's Orphée when the poet is given the advice, Astonish me! The Johnsonian definition of a work of art is also meaningful to me, and that is that a work of art must either make life more enjoyable or more endurable. Another quality, which I think forms part of the definition, is that a work of art is always exhilarating and never depressing, whatever its subject matter may be. In view of the particular exhilaration of Alex's religious fantasies, has the film run into trouble with clerical critics? Kubrick The reaction of the religious press has been mixed, although a number of superb reviews have been written. One of the most perceptive reviews of the religious press, or any other press, appeared in the Catholic News, written by John E. Fitzgerald, and I would like to quote one portion of it. In print, we've been told, in B.F. Skinner's Beyond Freedom and Dignity, 
that man is but a grab bag of conditioned reflexes, unscreened with images rather than words. Stanley Kubrick shows that man is more than a mere product of heredity and or environment. For as Alex's clergyman friend, a character who starts out as a fire and brimstone spouting buffoon, but ends up as the spokesman for the film's thesis, says, when a man cannot choose, he ceases to be a man. The film seems to say that to take away a man's choice is not to redeem, but merely restrain him. Otherwise, we have a society of oranges, organic but operating like clockwork. Such brainwashing, organic and psychological, is a weapon that totalitarians in state, church, or society might wish for an easier good, even at the cost of individual rights and dignity. Redemption is a complicated thing, and change must be motivated from within rather than imposed from without if moral values are to be upheld. But Kubrick is an artist rather than a moralist, and he leaves it to us to figure what's wrong and why, what should be done, and how it should be accomplished. This concludes today's reading, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for sticking with me to the end. I very much enjoyed our conversation on the live chat. Let's do this again soon. We'll see you later then. Bye.